Okay, good morning to everybody. Uh, today is Monday in, in uh, week 12. Uh, it's Veterans Day, so happy Veterans Day to everybody who is a veteran or has a loved one who has served, and we thank you for your service. And uh, as a son and grandson, a great-grandson of uh, Army veterans, I uh, do appreciate uh, that service. So uh, what we're going to do today, we, we have just finished out uh, the, well, the second segment of the class this last week, and uh, Exam two is available. If anybody has any ongoing questions about that, feel free to get with me. I'm more than glad to uh, go over uh, any questions on the exam that I'm able to. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about, we've only got two more chapters to go this semester. Can you believe it? So chapter 15 talks about budgeting. We're going to start that today. We'll, we'll pick that up through next week um, because of the fact that obviously the 17th is, is, is not probably going to be feasible because we're just starting this new uh, module. Uh, I've already adjusted the due dates for the homework quiz and bonus to the 24th. So keep in mind that is that is there. And then after next week, we only have really one additional chapter to cover. And that deals with um, something called standard costing and something called a balanced scorecard, which we're really gonna really sort of peek into the uh, the possibilities of what the standard, the, the balanced scorecard could do. It's really a, a method of, of assessing managers' performance, and it's um, and there are all kinds of variations on that. So for those of you who are interested in, in managerial accounting as a as a future endeavor in your life, uh, balanced scorecard is it's a fairly new concept, but not that new, and uh, it really takes into account the idea that managers are assessed on a lot of different areas that we can score based upon their performance. And I know certainly when I was in the corporate world, we uh, used a, a variety of different scorecards that were sort of uh, designed and appropriated to uh, to meet our particular needs. And so uh, the, the final week is our final exam. It'll be available probably on that Friday. It'll, and and it's the, the price base is programmed for that to pop up on Friday. And, um, and you'll have through that Friday to do it. And I know that, that um, usually these exams are due on, on Sunday. And they, it, the semester actually ends on Sunday, but if somebody gets kicked out or has a power outage, which I guess sometimes happens, uh, and gives us a couple of days maybe maybe to uh, to deal with that. But beyond the eighth, we really don't have any flexibility at all whatsoever because I've got to report grades no later than the 10th. And that's a hard and fast rule and uh, and that, that sort of thing. But we'll talk about that as we get deeper into the, into the, uh, into the semester. If anybody has any questions about anything regarding any of that, uh, the, the the planning and whatnot, because I know sometimes people get busy toward the end of the semester and uh, things come up and uh, I try to make it as easy as possible on you and uh, and give you the most time that is allowable to, to work on exams. Uh, so, all right, so let's talk about chapter 15, budgetary planning. So what is budgeting all about? Well, I have sort of been uh, throughout this semester already sort of weaving in and out of the, the topic of budgeting. And we've been talking about its importance in business, particularly the idea that we, at some point, as a business entity, plan for the future. And it's and, and we're not usually talking about very long-range plans because those tend to be a little bit more flexible and uh, and subject to change, much more than say a one-year projection. And most budgets are based on an annual sort of projection. And we'll, we'll talk about where some of the ideas come from for developing the, the, the sort of forecast of things that are to come. I know that very few firms go out very, very long range in terms of planning. I know one of the exceptions to this that I think I mentioned in the class was Boeing, which I think has sort of a, at least a sales budget that goes out about 20 years. And uh, that's pretty unusual. <laughs> that is very unusual for a business firm, but they're making expensive goods with very long time horizons and a very long production period. And so you, that wouldn't be terribly surprising for that organization. And all the trouble that Boeing has had over the, the last few years uh, with the 737 MAX and whatnot, uh, nonetheless, they still have to do long-range planning. But that's unusual. That that long, long time scheme is unusual. It's usually much shorter. And I know that, and, and well, this is an area personally that I've had lots of experience in working with, and that is putting together budgets in a corporate context. And usually what we would do the companies that I worked for would be to plan sometime in the fall. All the companies I worked for, by the way, were on a fiscal year, January 1st to December 31st. So the calendar year was their fiscal year. 
we'll talk about what, what fiscal means. And usually around this time of year, uh, right where we are right now, we would be sort of wrapping up our budgeting process and uh, and talking about you know, what we expect to do next year, what our revenues, expenses were, and what our capital expenditures were on things like equipment and facilities, and all those things are sort of cashed out. And that doesn't mean this is etched in stone. In fact, one of the things that, uh, for those of you who are, who are going to be accounting majors, you will probably be exposed to the idea of something that's known as flexible budgeting, where budgeting is not a annual event like a three-week event, you know, where everyone, all the top managers go to some hotel in the mountains somewhere and, and huddle up, which they may do. But the idea is that this is revised again and again and again, and the budgeting process is never ending. It always goes on and on and on. And I'm particularly struck by that idea just because of the fact that things happen and we just don't have the world wired like we think we do sometimes. And that's just the way it is. The world is chaotic. Things happen. There are things out of our control. And it's going to upset budget plans. By the way, um, I can recall when I was in, in banking in, on September 11th, 2001, the terrorist attacks. We had a conference call the next day. And our, our my boss said, you know what? The budget is out for the year. It's done. Well, there's no way we can meet our objectives. Um, because everyone was just sort of huddled into their own little caves. Nobody really wanted to do anything. And it made the economy really took a hit as a result of that. That may have been one of the uh, intended purposes of the terrorist attacks. I don't know. But this is something none of us plan for. There's no budgeting for a major terrorist attack. So so the idea that, that we've got this all figured out and that we're the wizards, the Wizard of Oz behind the, the curtain is not a... a particularly productive and realistic picture. So let's talk about some of the, we have five learning objectives in this particular module. We'll cover, maybe we'll get to the second one today because I, I think what I, my plan for today is to, is to sort of get into the most the introductory material, talking about the types of budgets, the budgeting process, why it's why it's set up, who's involved, and, uh, and why it's important. So we'll talk about what the essentials are of budgeting, and we'll talk about this thing called the master budget. The master budget is sort of this overall aggregation of all individual budgets that sort of fold up into it. Then we'll talk about individual budgets. I don't think we're going to get through this. I'm pretty sure we're not going to get through this today. But we'll talk about the sales budget, which is where everything begins. And sales budget, which is also sometimes called a revenue budget, is the, uh, is, is the next thing in line. And that is, what do we expect to produce in terms of revenue? For whatever kind of industry we're in, even financial companies like insurance companies want to know how much premiums, uh, how much premium dollars they're going to be taking in. But if it's a merchandising company or manufacturing, it's sales dollars of things that we're selling, both in terms of units and in terms of dollars. And from there, if we know, if we, if we the questions that we know, if we have an idea of what we think the sales are going to be, then we can produce those goods. Again, we're coming back to the manufacturing context here. What do we need to produce in order to meet the sales that are projected? And this sort of coordination is really sort of the trick of budgeting. And that is, we've got sales, but they're not even throughout the year. They're sort of lumpy, and uh, and they can change throughout the year. Therefore, our production schedule goes up and down. And I know a lot of people aren't, you know, are are, are kind of uh, confused as to why sometimes production ramps up and dials down. Sometimes you may have workers who are doing. 20 hours of overtime for weeks on end, and then suddenly they're lucky to get the 40 hours in. In fact, maybe some people are actually, some of the, the temporary people are laid off even, and yet the company is doing is going great guns, and so that, it's, it's the seasonality sometimes that is an issue. We'll talk about the issue of direct materials and also the other things like direct labor, overhead, selling administrative expenses, which are mostly fixed in nature, uh, their period costs, We'll build an income statement that's a, a budgeted income statement that in accounting and parlance we call a pro forma income statement. That is, we're developing a statement that we think is going to be in, uh, the reality of the coming year. Now, by the way, this is not just a, an internal issue as well. Um, because remember, just to kind of back out a little bit from where we are here, in, in a college accounting courses, we always take the point of view of a publicly traded corporation, for profit, owned by shareholders, and so. Uh, and because it's it's publicly traded, uh, businesses are always expected to give a projection as to a couple of things. Number one, sales—that's an important one there—and also what the net income figure is going to be. 
And on a quarterly basis, they report those because they're required to. And the financial community really holds their feet to the fire. And if they exceed those targets, great. You guys are geniuses. You, you, you managers are geniuses. If, you, if they don't meet the targets, uh, they can have all kinds of explanations why. But the financial community tends to not be uh, very charitable, let's just say, uh, in its assessment of, of that performance, whether it's a quarterly or annual performance. And so budgeting is a process that is not just internal. It's also got external ramifications. Even though this kind of goes against a little bit of what I've been saying throughout this course that managerial accounting is accounting for the inside internal use. But keep in mind that it also has a, a communication purpose with the investment community as to what the company expects to be selling and earning and growing or not growing and you know in, in, in certain areas and whatnot. And what's very interesting for those of you who are uh, sort of into this kind of thing, stock investors and whatnot, these companies have quarterly conference calls that anybody can really get into. You simply dial into it. Usually it starts out with the CEO having a statement, very uh, upbeat, almost always, regardless of the facts. Then the CFO comes in and starts to tear into the financial information, the, the accounting information, and then people start asking questions. And so uh, they are accountable. And by the way, that's going to kind of lead us back to where we're going to go in the final module of the course, which deals with how we assess management performance. Managers are assessed on their performance. I know that for those of us who may have started out working at a you know, it's a very entry-level job, as I think most of us have, certainly I have. Uh, we kind of think that managers are immune from the uh, the scrutiny and the overall, um, you know, supervision of others. But that's not true, because they all are. Every, everyone is subject to supervision. And to make matters more unsettling, everyone is replaceable. And that sounds very unsettling. And uh, But I would be lying to you if I said that that's not the case, because that is the case. And so... Uh, this idea of communicating what expectations are and being able to meet them. That doesn't mean that you're on the street if you, you know, have a bad, you know, short time, short term period, but if it goes on and on, well, things things could change with regard to your status. Okay. We're, we're talking about a cash budget and a budget and balance sheet. So um, this will be, we'll, we'll probably get into this next week. We'll, and probably on Monday, I'll, I'll talk about this idea of the cash budget. Who's mostly interested in this would be the Treasury. I'm talking about the corporate treasury, and uh, that's really their main job is to make sure the company has adequate cash. If they don't have the adequate cash on hand at any time. They have to have a way to go get cash through the lines of credit with lenders or some other means. And we'll get to those means a little bit later. And then we'll talk about this idea of application to non manufacturing entities. And I know that we have a definite um, accounting uh, courses, definitely have a, a manufacturing orientation. But as I've said numerous times before, that some of the, the uh, concepts are applicable to other entities as well, particularly and most importantly, service entities. So the first, the first objective we're going to talk about today, which is going to be most of our um, class time, is going to be devoted to this idea of what, what, what budgeting is and what it's about. So we'll talk about effective budgeting. First of all, um, <clears throat> sort of a definitional item, there's a formal written statement of management's plans. Now, obviously, you've got the PowerPoint slides available and all this is in the textbook. But it's something that management puts together on paper and says, this is what we plan to do. And the budgeting process itself can be uh, can be contentious at times. And I can tell you that I've been at budget meetings where uh, we've been there all day and people are getting, nerves are being frayed and, and uh, fingers are being pointed. And uh, some managers will say, we can't do this, we can't do that. We can't. And, and it just goes back and forth. And uh, and sometimes it's not a very smooth process. And so what looks like a, a very smooth exterior, uh, interior, interior wise, not always is the case. So, and they're expressed in financial terms, that is dollar terms. So again, uh, even though accounting is really not, not about math, it's really not, we express things quantitatively um, and uh, often in dollar terms. So it's the primary method of, of communicating agreed upon objectives throughout the organization. So a lot of companies will come up with a budget for the for the coming year and will communicate that to everybody who uh, management feels can benefit from knowing the information. And it's oftentimes broken down and, and molded into um, more relevant information depending upon the, 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 the uh, the particular unit that the information is being conveyed to. Not everybody wants to hear about things like what we're going to spend on 
capital budgeting, how we're going to refinance debt or whatever. And a lot of employees really could care less. And I, I think that's important to know. That, but I think that they do want to know what they really are expected to do for this coming year, where we're going. You know, I think jobs are more meaningful when people understand. Jobs are more, I, I should say, jobs are more satisfactory, I think, when they are more meaningful, when we know what we're doing. And and I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, the first company I had to work for was a very profitable company. But a lot of times, and they were very stingy with information. We A lot of times the budget information that we got, the communication was not very clear at all. And so we oftentimes didn't really know what the bigger picture was. And there would be a lot of times I'd leave at the end of the day, oftentimes after the sun went down after a long day, thinking, what exactly am I doing, right? Because I really don't know how this fits into the bigger picture. The next company I worked for was very open about it. And they said, this is what your contribution is. And personally, this is just my own personal viewpoint, I think jobs are more satisfying when we know what we're doing. It doesn't make the job easier. It doesn't make the scrutiny and the supervision less intense. But I think it does make life you know, more satisfying to know what it is we're doing. Promotes efficiency. It's also a control device. This term of control, control comes up all the time in, in uh, accounting. It's this idea of, uh, if, if we go back to these, these management concepts, what is the role of management generally? Planning, organizing, con and, and controlling. Uh, I always thought, as on a day-to-day -day basis as a manager, my big job was controlling things, keeping things in between the lines. And, uh, and, and by the way, if you can control things and keeping them going, then it really allows you to, to better achieve your goals that are assigned to you as a manager individually. And then the one thing about it is that I, I so said they can be scaled to various functional levels. And that is they can be molded, dropped down into individual department levels, individual work level units, and, uh, and everyone can sort of know what it is they're expected to do. And I know the term control has sort of gotten a negative uh, reputation just in society generally, you know, the idea of somebody being controlling and whatnot. But in, in the business world, though, control is a pretty important uh, idea. The idea that, that we have things uh, more or less under control that we're not dealing with unexpected things. And when unexpected things come up, we have ways to deal with them. And, uh, and that furthermore, we have a culture by which people are accountable. Again, that word accountable and account can kind of go together. And then we can assess performance in a quantitative fashion. And all the things that go into control. We talked a lot about this in, in accounting one, principles one, this idea of internal control. It's an important element of management, and it very definitely involves the accounting function, particularly the internal audit function, which makes sure that sort of the internal police force, just for lack of a better term, uh, to make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. So how do we put it together budgets? And I think this is a really important topic. I really like the way the, the authors put together this, this particular first couple of modules, or first couple of uh, learning objectives in this module. Historical data is oftentimes the most, uh, the most uh, important starting point. Um, and it's this idea, it kind of goes back to the idea of relevant costs and relevant revenues, where particularly when we're talking about, as in the last segment of the class, <clears throat> this idea of, of you know, we're, we're doing a million dollars in sales now, are we going to do 10 million next year? Well, that would be a big leap. I'm not saying it never happens, but you'd have to, something major would have to happen in order to make that happen. Instead, maybe a million dollars in sales going to 1.3 million, that would make a lot of sense. And, but how would you get there? You would sort of look at historical data to tell you where we've been, and then we can write the story of where we expect to be in the very near term, like a year, maybe two years to the outside. But the annual budgeting is really what we're sort of looking at here. So that's sort of the basis uh, for this. And the accounting function is, this is again where accountants play a big role in, in saying what is realistic and what it's gonna cost us to do things. And very often accountants are looked at as being um, sort of people who hold, hold up the stop sign and say, we can't do this. And why can't we do it? Well, because we don't have the budget for this. And, uh, and so, uh, so uh, oftentimes accountants get that sort of reputation. Um, but I think to, make, to be fair, I would say that they're trying to be realistic because there are times in which managers are overly optimistic as to their, their particular budget plans. And by the way, the the academic literature on overly ambitious budgeting is 
is, is pretty broad where managers come in, usually new managers, top managers who come in saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Those are all ambitious goals. We're all going to work 90 hours a week and we're going to get this done. We're all going to be happy and all that. And it doesn't make sense. And it's overly optimistic. And those plans fail simply because of the fact that they're overly ambitious. And we'll talk about this idea of what is reasonable. And I think it's not reasonable to expect every employee to work 90 hours a week. As somebody who used to work 90 hours a week, I can tell you it does not, it is not sustainable. It, human beings are not built to do that. And uh, any company that thinks that they're going to push workers to do that, they may get a short-term benefit, but long-term, that will not work. I can almost guarantee you that. And so we'll talk about budget administration and their responsibility of management. And what I like about this is the idea that as people get higher in management, there are really two things that, that their time is devoted to. Number one, it's budget. And number two is personnel. Budget and personnel are the two things that really absorb the time of people as they get higher and higher in management. And why is that? Well, first of all, when we talk about budget, we're not talking about the budgeting process. We're talking about comparing actual performance against budget and looking at all the actual performance data as it rolls in periodically, sometimes in, in very, very quick fashion. Uh, there's a particular tool that's used in management called dashboard reporting, where a lot of the key metrics, what we call KPIs or key performance indicators are updated maybe on a monthly basis, maybe weekly, maybe daily. And a lot of top managers want to see exactly where things are in more or less real time. Dashboard reporting allows that. There's a lot of software that can enable that where it's sort of, sort of gathering all the information. So budget is not so much about budgeting as a process uh, that lasts all year, but rather the comparison to budget to find out where we're off, where we're doing great, and maybe trying to control things from there. Again, the control mechanism is there. So that's the one function. The other is personnel. Top management oftentimes is dealing with, with uh, names and faces that are moving around and trying to determine who goes where. I know that when I was in management, we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to figure out where we should put certain people based upon their skill level, their experience, and whatnot. And uh, as I got to upper management, I found that was a lot of what I was doing during the day was determining who should go where and why, and who is it they should report to, and all those kind of things. So budget and personnel. So budget and administration are the responsibility of management. And we, as we'll see in the next segment, we'll talk about how they are um, held accountable. So what are some of the benefits of budgeting? Um, number one, it requires all levels of management to plan ahead. To the extent that all levels of management do get involved, I would sort of take a little bit of issue with this first point because there are a lot of organizations in which all levels of management do not uh, participate. And there are all kinds of theories and arguments about whether or not every level of management should participate. But one thing is very clear, in some organizations, a lot of members do not participate in it, particularly what we call the top-down uh, 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 top method, which your text doesn't really get into very much. Instead, it focuses a lot on the opposite, which is the bottom-up. We're going to get to it in a second. And, and I'll talk more about the top-down versus bottom up in a second, but um, I, I don't know that all levels of management do plan ahead. First of all, management is a pretty broadly construed concept, and who is in, in who's captured in management? Obviously, top management, uh, there's no question that they fall into that category, and middle management as well, but uh, at what point do we include supervisors who manage shifts? Are they members of management? And I, and I think technically, management theorists would say, yes, they are supervisory personnel, regardless of their background, regardless of their experience, if they manage other people and they're responsible for achieving a particular business units or a particular work level units uh, objectives, then that would put them in management. But how much they really are involved in the budgeting process, I think is, is wildly variable. I think sometimes uh, the participation is really non-existent, quite frankly, okay? It provides objectives for evaluating performance. This will tie into the talent scorecard we're going to get to. Creates an early warning system. Okay, this is where we get to this idea of the dashboard where managers can see information very, very quickly. I know that the first couple of organizations I worked for, we would have to report our information on a weekly basis. And uh, usually on a Monday morning, we had to really talk about what happened last week. We would get a great detail numerically, quantitatively, who did what, when. And... Um, 
And if, if the numbers were really disastrous, then, then there would be intervention, I guess you could say, uh, as to the, the particular activity. What's going on? Why did this happen? Um, that sort of a thing. And, uh, and, and, and it could be a one-off, right? I mean, it may not be something that uh, is really needing to intervention. Um, if you're in the northern half of the country, I grew up in the, in, and began working in the, up in the upper Great Lakes area, um, you know, sometimes in months of January and February, our business was extremely slow, mostly because the sort of culture there is that people just kind of go to work and they got kind of go home and they don't really do much. It's just too darn cold. Yeah, they go out and ice fish, I guess, but that doesn't, you know, that's, that, that's not really an economic activity at all. So um, you have to understand that sometimes slowdowns can happen just because of the, the time of year and whatnot. So uh, it also facilitates coordination of activities. We're not going to really get much into that, but uh, it's the idea that everyone's got a role to play and sometimes they work in other, in tandem with other business units. Uh, also greater management awareness. So some of this is a little bit redundant. Motivates personnel or, or demotivates, whatever the case might be. And then my, the green is my input. It's also a means of assessing management performance. And what I just talked about, the idea of actual versus budget. So when we talk about um, managerial accounting, remember it's based on the idea of internal reporting to management, hence the term managerial. And very often a lot of the reporting is going to be based upon the idea of what are the, the category is? Sales, actual budget, all the way down the line, actual budget, actual budget, all the way down the line, whatever the category is. What we did versus what we planned to do, and then the variance. And I think we should be realistic in, in understanding that the actual is pretty much always going to differ a little bit from the budgeting. Uh, there is nobody who is that good to say, we're going to do X billion in sales in October and land exactly on that figure. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, and in fact, everywhere, it's, it's sort of an axiom in accounting and finance that um, anybody who's hitting their numbers exactly is probably giving you a, 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 a tall tale that's really not right. After I left the first company to work with, the guy I worked for and his boss both got fired for providing phony baloney numbers that were just coincidentally, this happened to be actual, that met the budget of numbers. And that sort of didn't meet the spell test and as in looking into it. Uh, and it was really something very stupid that really had nothing to do with the overall objectives. But they got both terminated. They were both very high, high ranking people. And, uh, but, you know, this idea of fudging numbers, that's no bueno. We can't allow that to happen. And so uh, hitting the numbers exactly is difficult. By the way, um, the, this is a little bit off topic, but not really. Bernie Madoff and his, um, for those of you who've heard of Bernie Madoff, who was running a massive con job on his investors, was hitting targets year after year after year, almost exactly, and the, the rate of return was very constant. And that was enough to indicate to a lot of people that there was something not right. So missing numbers is going to happen, either over or under, and that's really the issue. So we talk about a column we have actual and budgeted, it's usually what the variance is, positive or negative. And you're going to have some categories that are going to be over, some are going to be under, and, uh, and that's just the way it's going to be. So it's just a way of, of looking throughout the year as to where things are versus what we had planned them to be. By the way, I'm going to circle back to this idea of historical analysis, and that is that these actual numbers are used to sort of inform the budgeting process going forward. And that is, if we were overly optimistic about sales or cost of goods sold or whatever, whatever the, the value is, that our actual performance will should inform us that we had it wrong, we had it right, or we were overly optimistic or, or not optimistic enough. And so that oftentimes feeds into where things are going. And so uh, a good budgeting process takes into account what has actually been done, because it's one thing to say this is what we're going to do, I could say I'm going to fly to Mars tomorrow, right? It's not going to happen, but if I've already done it, then if I've already gone to Mars, then well, that gives me a little bit of credibility about future trips to Mars, right? Okay, and then often these are used in long-run strategic planning. And I bring this up only because, for those of you who are going to be doing a bachelor's degree somewhere in business, uh, one of the final courses that you probably will take, I don't know uh, what UNM's setup is in a business school uh, in Anderson, but... Very often, the last course is something called strategic planning or 
policy or strategic management, something that's it's the same thing, really. It's, it's, a, it's an idea of what is the long-term plan. Now, this does this contradict what I've talked about in terms of budgeting? That we said budgeting is better and more effective when it's short-term, and now I've got this usefulness for long-term. No, I don't think there's a contradiction at all, because we can sort of see where things may be laying themselves out over very long time periods, but we may not create an actual budget for five years down the road. In fact, I would argue that was, that's not something we should do. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking long-term, and successful businesses are thinking long-term. Where is it that we are going with this? And what should we be doing? And, um, and thinking long-term is important, even though it may not involve the formal budgeting process that we're talking about here, okay? All right, so any questions so far about anything, anything we've talked about so far? Okay, so we have one of these review questions that pop up. Which of the following is not a benefit of, man of budgeting? Management can plan ahead. Early warning system enables disciplinary action. The coordination of activities. Well, we haven't talked anything about disciplinary action, so um, that's not what budgeting is, is, is about. It's not necessarily a negative uh, tool to be used in negative responses to disciplined people or whatnot. And I'm not saying it never happens, because it does happen, but that's not the... That's not the purpose. That's not the purpose of, of budgeting. It's not to set people up for failure. And if it is, and I'm not saying it's never happened. If someone has been set up for failure, then I would say that's not a particularly good organization that you want to work for. Okay. When I was doing my MBA quite a long time ago, um, I had a professor who said something that just rang and, and just sort of got saved in my memory banks. And he said, look, if you have a boss who likes to fire people, you better never turn your back on that person. And that's right, that is entirely right, because there are bosses out there that love to find things that are going wrong and to get this confrontational thing going. I had a couple of those in my existence. And fortunately, my dad, who had a long career in business, said, you know what, those managers usually don't last very long. He was sort of right about that. So, uh, because the fact that nobody really likes to work for somebody who's got just nothing but negative feedback. People have other opportunities and whatnot. So the budgeting process is not used for personnel management. This is not a contradiction of what I said before, that top managers spend most of their time dealing with budget and personnel issues. But the personnel issues are mostly about who do we promote, who do we move around, who do we, uh, uh, who do we tap for this job, who do we uh, do these kind of things. So, that's, so I think we should be a little bit careful on that uh, issue there. When we talk about budgeting, um, it depends upon the sound organizational structure, authority, and responsibility uh, for operations are clearly defined. This, there's a long running um, uh, discussion in management, particularly among management theorists, academic uh, uh, business school folks like me, where about this idea of authority and responsibility. And the idea is if you're given responsibility for something, you want to be given the authority to make decisions to impact that. And sometimes, these two must go together, and uh, a lot of companies don't realize this. The authority and responsibility must go together. If we say that you're responsible for this achievement of this particular goal, then fine. Give me the authority to go buy a new computer or not right at minimum more, to hire a couple of employees or bring on a couple of attempts. Give me the authority so that I can do the kind of things to achieve that. And then this is what I really like. Based upon research, and it should be objective, and there should be a lot of people who are really have got their thinking caps on and then the goals, whatever the goals are, must be achievable with difficulty. And that, I put that in quotes because that's a sort of a mantra that exists within the corporate world that a goal should be achievable with difficulty. If it's unachievable, then it's not really a goal, right? If we're doing a million dollars in sales in one particular division and we're expected to do 20 million in the next year, that might not be realistic unless we're given a lot of authority to do uh, something in order to achieve that. I'm not saying those kind of growth rates don't exist. And we've seen those in the last few years in areas like technology and whatnot. Uh, but they've got to be achievable. And they've got to be achievable with difficulty. So I think the idea is that we want to challenge all the members of an organization to work hard, to be thinking about things, to offer their input, to offer suggestions that are intended to advance the goals of the organization. And I'm a firm believer that most employees are interested in achieving the goals of the organization. I really believe that. 
I think most people are of goodwill. Most are not trying to sabotage the efforts. They want to contribute. They want to be successful. And they understand that it will be a bit difficult, but not impossible. If it's impossible, then that's that only serves to frustrate. And, and, and by the way, if you create a budget that's impossible to meet, then the budget doesn't mean anything. And all the action plans that are that are devised in terms of what we do on this day, on this day, on this, they don't mean anything because the the overall budget doesn't make sense. It's got to be. It's, it's got to make sense. It's going to be achievable with difficulty, and it's it's simply got to be something that's realistic. By the way, I, there was I was talking with somebody not too long ago about uh, the first bank that I worked for. I worked for two major banks in the Midwest, and the first one that we had was. We were part of a, a bigger bank one based in, in Columbus, Ohio, and our entity, we were purchased by them. And at one point, we, the budget was already set for the next coming year. So by November, I think it was locked in. And it turns out that sometime late in the year, uh, one of the divisions wanted to take over a particular entity. I think it was lending on autos from our particular uh, unit, from our particular corporation. We had a little subsidiary corporation and management on high decided, okay, we'll let you do it because it makes sense. Your argument makes sense. You're closer physically. Uh, so from a geographical standpoint, it also makes sense. So we'll do that. But they didn't revise the budget for the company that was losing that. And so that our senior manager said, well, we've got to make up this revenue somehow. And it's like, you know, I mean, why would you do that? that to me, that violates, and I was not all that sophisticated. This was, I was only maybe four or five years in the business world. And I thought, why on earth would you do that? Why would you take something away, an entire area of business, and then say, well, you've got to make that up. I'm sorry, it's going to go somewhere else without adjusting one's budget. And uh, I don't know what all those discussions were behind closed doors. I really don't. All I know that was communicated to us was, we've got to make up that gap. And everyone was sort of pulling their hair out because of the idea that, yes, it's one thing to give difficult objectives, it's another to, to do them when you've got one hand tied behind your back. And so I think that really, really, really is something that is a cautionary tale. And uh, again, I think it's important for us to realize that it's going to make sense. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the, the budget period. Um, it can be done for any period of time. However, as I mentioned, one year is really the most common. I think as you get beyond one year, the, the further out in time you go, the more, the less reliable your projections are. Too many things can happen in the meantime. Just things that we have absolutely no control over. Interest rates, tax policy, regulation, um, you know, competition that comes in or goes out. Who knows? It's just really too difficult to go too far out in the distant future. So a one-year budget is, is makes a lot of sense. However, subsidiary budgets, like a monthly or quarterly budgets, can be created. And in fact, when I was in the corporate world, we oftentimes broke things down on a monthly basis with, you know, not exactly taking the annual number divided by 12, but rather spreading these out depending upon seasonality. And seasonality is a feature of a lot of different industries. But different budgets can cover different time periods, but for the most part, a year is the, uh, is, is the, the most common. And also to deal with these idea of seasonal and cyclical fluctuations. Let's talk about these two here real quickly. I know I'm spending some time on these preliminaries, but I really think that uh, whoever you know graduates in it from a business program and goes into business is going to be dealing with some sort of budget issue as they go. And so I think these this terminology is important. Seasonal really deals with the ups and downs of, of uh, fluctuations in sales and cash flow throughout the year. Obviously, retailers ramp up this time of year. They're going to be selling more inventory, and so they got to ramp up on inventory to be able to sell it for the fourth quarter holiday sales. Uh, after the fourth quarter, things sort of drop, sort of fall off a cliff. If you are a uh, uh, you know, company that, that operates you know, a resort uh, or an area, you're probably going to get a seasonal issue going on there, whether it's uh, in, you know, whether it's in you know, it's wine, probably going to be busier in the wintertime as opposed to the summertime. Uh, so people flocking there. So seasonal just obviously makes sense throughout the year. The changes for what for all kinds of reasons. Agriculture is very definitely seasonal. In some parts of the country, construction is very seasonal, where you really can't do a lot of things if the, if the ground is frozen. 
So seasonality is a big issue. Cycle growth has more to do with the business cycle of where things are with regard to the overall economy. And if the economy is going great guns, that's going to affect your, your outlook. And this is one of the tough ones. And I'll talk more about the, the role of economists in making in, in contributing to the budgeting process because we talk about cyclical fluctuations. We're talking about this idea that the business cycle doesn't just go on a straight linear upward trajectory over time. It is ups and downs and ups and downs. And fortunately, uh, economic policy has gotten much better at sort of smoothing those out. But we have not outlawed recessions and, and uh, really boom times in certain industries. And so these fluctuations have got to be accounted for to the extent possible and what we expect to see happen. So a lot of times, if you expect the economy to be slowing down, I think there is some idea the economy will slow down a bit in the future, uh, but not very much, then I think you would take that into account. And again, I think shorter the better, really. I think that is you're more reliable in short run estimates as opposed to long run estimates. I think there's too much that can happen in the long run, which, uh, by the way, is sort of mirrored in the bond market. We usually have higher yields on longer term securities, bonds, for instance, and shorter term securities because so much more can happen in the long term than in the short term. And as long as I've been around the business world, uh, it's it, it astonished me how poorly we can estimate what's going on down the road. I think our our antenna and our projection, I think it's really, really, really hard to make long-term forecasts. I just, and people who say that they can do it, uh, I don't believe in Frankfurt. I just think it's really hard to go too far out in the future and make predictions. It's just really hard because there are too many things that we don't anticipate. The things that we never expected to happen will happen. And the longer you're around, the more life will just shock and surprise you because things happen. So the shorter time frame, the better. And that gives a, a better baseline then for assessing management performance and expecting what that performance to be uh, in terms of being reasonable. Okay, so the process. So let's talk about what's going on here. So again, past performance is oftentimes a, a uh, sort of base driver for this, <clears throat> collecting data from all the organizational units. And again, as I mentioned, beginning several months before the year end, this is a very common theme. The idea that the budgeting process takes up takes place sometime before the year starts. This is sort of a, a little bit in contradiction with some of the chapters which I had pointed out earlier, where they said at the beginning of the year we're gonna you know, we're gonna establish these goals. No, at the beginning of the year is already in the period in which you're trying to to make a budget and an assessment. It's it's before that year starts that we need to do the planning. And so it's several months, and I, I think in, in my experience, we would usually start budgeting around October, and, uh, and we would usually finish sometime in November. But then there were all, always, for, for a, a fiscal year that was, a fiscal or budget year that ran from January to December, and it didn't mean that we wouldn't be making changes, even into January, I can remember um, meeting and saying, well, now things have changed, so now things, we've got to make some changes as to what's going on. So it begins sometime before that fiscal year begins. And it all begins really within the framework of the sales forecast. We are going to get to that today to talk about the sort of the primacy of that particular uh, budget uh, you know, budget plan. And we talk about what the sales forecast really is. It talks about what the potential industry sales are going to be. Not the firm sales, but the industry sales. What is the industry? The industry is the ecosystem the competitive environment in which the firm itself operates. And so the one thing to know is what is the industry itself going to do? And that is if we know what total industry sales are going to be, knowing that we don't have 100% market share and what company does, there's, I can't think of almost any company that has 100% market share on anything, mostly because of the fact that we sort of break those entities up. But we don't, we don't know what the entire ecosystem is going to generate. And sometimes it involves the work of economists who are looking ahead and do econometric forecasts to decide, you know, what is actually going on? What's, what, you know, what are car sales going to be for the entire industry? And then once we know what the entire industry is going to do, then we can break it down to our particular market share and that would inform our sales budget. If we have, a, we have perpetually a 35% market share in auto sales, then, and that seems to be a pretty reliable metric going forward, then we can say, okay, if we expect the, the, auto sales to be 400 billion next year, then we can sort of work with that as a top line 
In other words, revenue figure for us, and then work down from there, okay? Again, the share of sales would be important here. Market share, that is, and market share is simply based upon this. It's simply the revenue of the firm, right? So total revenue, TR, of the firm, which is a dollar figure divided by total revenue of the industry, which is also a dollar figure. And you're gonna end up with some value that's gonna be expressed as a percentage, okay? So if the industry is selling $1,000 and we sell 400, we're gonna have a 40% market share, okay? And that's what market share is. It's always expressed as a percentage. And so this is a pretty good starting point for establishing a sales budget. What is our market share? Keeping in mind, of course, all this, all these kaleidoscopic things that are coming around. I talked about this idea of a kaleidoscope where we've all looked through it, where you turn the wheel and you get all the glasses moving. It's not just one thing moves, but all the little pieces of glass are moving. Keeping in mind that whatever happens, things are moving, moving, moving. So we've got to keep that into account. Maybe market share of 40% doesn't make sense. We're going to be losing market share because of foreign competition or because of the fact that, uh, you know, we want to simply dial down our presence, whatever the case might be. Uh, we've got to take that into account. But knowing what the, the broader competitive environment is makes sense. And for those who get hired to management, you will be looking a lot at your competition. I, I know that, um, uh, you know, I was never at the very, very top management when I was in banking, but I know a lot of my uh, supervisors from very much on a high were always looking at what competition was doing. What are they doing? What kind of products are they producing? Uh, and uh, how does that affect us? And so I think it's important for that particular sort of outside look to be important, okay? So what are the factors to be considered? Well, economic conditions, again, and we talked about this idea of economists being a, uh, an important piece of this. The employment of economists is controversial. I know that Warren Buffett, the great investor, has said that if you have an economist on staff, you have one too many employees. He doesn't think much of the idea of employing economists. Uh, I don't know that I completely agree with that idea. It's kind of hard for me to be disagree with Warren Buffett on this one particular topic, but uh, I think economists have oftentimes got an insight into where the economy is going that others do not by looking at things that others are not looking at. So I think it does make sense to, to look at that. What, what's going on in the industry itself? Is this an industry that's growing? Is it an industry that's shrinking? Um, I know that we, I think, have been accused, and rightly so, in accounting for presenting a view of business firms where we have year one, we have growth, and year two, we have growth, and year three, growth, 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 and net income, growth, growth, growth. When in reality, there are industries that are actually shrinking and we know they're shrinking. And the question is, what do we do about that? And you might say, well, stop doing that. Well, maybe not. Particularly if you're adding contribution margin, and which is contributing to the bottom line. Maybe you don't, but maybe you want to not put more resources into it. And for those of you who may study marketing, you'll see this idea that not all products are the same. You've got some products that are really growing rapidly. Some that are starting out look promising. Some that have been around for a long time. Uh, and aren't really adding that much contribution, but all the all the equipment has been depreciated off the books. Um, it's they've got a dominant market share, um, and why not keep selling the product as long as the product is selling, adding contribution margins. So these trends are important. Not always is it an upward trajectory, and I think that we have been accused, and I think again, as I said rightly so, for presenting scenarios where the business is growing, growing, growing. When in fact it may not be growing, maybe the opposite direction. But we have to know that. As long as we have our eyes open, we can know what to do about it. Market research, which is deals with which is sort of related to industry trends and overall conditions, where things are going in the market. What is the when we talk about the market, by the way, this is interesting too, because economists will view the market as being demand and supply together. The market is composed of the two actors, the actor sides of the economy, market, demand and supply. In the business school context, we usually refer to the market as the demand side. And so we're talking about what is going on with the demand side. What is happening? Are people wanting this particular product? Are they shying away from it? What is the particular market? And I saw a great um, story over the weekend on CNBC about a company that called Juul that created the e-cigarette. I don't think they were the first, but they were the biggest. And they did lots of market research to find out what was what did people want? A lot of people didn't want to keep smoking cigarettes, but they wanted nicotine. And so what was a better way to deliver that? There was a little bitty thing they would hear inhale. 
And uh, they themselves got into some difficulty with the government in that regard as well. But, but that's an example of market research. What do people really want? A lot of smokers, and I'm an ex-smoker, a lot of smokers don't want to smoke and would like to do something else. So maybe offer them an alternative. That would be an example of that. I bring it up one because I just saw that just sort of comes to mind, but that's just one among all the millions of examples. What, what we expect them to do in terms of advertising promotion, which all again fall into the marketing category. Marketing itself is really defined as the management of demand. Where we were previously uh, in terms of market share, what kind of price changes do we expect throughout the year? Technological developments are always an important one. This is something that uh, is a long, long, long running story in the industrial revolution. And that is what's gonna go on with technology. More importantly, how do we react to changes in technology? The biggest story in business right now, by far, by far, by far, is artificial intelligence and what we all are supposed to do with it. It is the biggest story. If you turn on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, read the Wall Street Journal, read Business Week, I, I will promise you you'll see something, if, you watch, uh, if you're looking there long enough, something about artificial intelligence, which is progressing rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. To the point where I don't think anybody really knows where this is going and, uh, and, and what to do about it. But we're using it even in academia, in some of my own research, you know, if I want uh, some sort of boiled down uh, synopsis of where research is on a particular area, uh, AI can deliver that extremely quickly. Uh, the capabilities here, I think, are beyond our own brain power, and uh, I think it's amazing. So keep an eye on that. That's, but that's an important issue. And any kind of change in government policy, which is my addition here, taxes and regulation, these are things which make the long-range long range planning difficult because we just simply don't know what's coming down the road. We don't know what changes in tax policy are. By the way, uh, we have a new president, or we will have a new president, uh, who's our old president, who's proposing over the weekend, I think he uh, had a presentation about lowering the corporate tax rate, which was lowered already in 2017 from 39 to 21. He wants to lower it to 15%. Um, whether or not that gets done, I don't know, but um, that would be something that would be very much uh, important to look at if you're a corporation, that low of a tax rate. So we'll have to see. The regulation is something that is always changing, it's very unpredictable, and but yet yeah, it's an important piece of the overall compliance. And uh, companies in pretty much every industry over a long time have complained about regulation. What else is new? It's like, you know, anybody telling you what to do is, is, a, regula is a regulator, and uh, anybody coming and inspecting your premises and asking for reports and feedback and data and, and all this. and. Uh, is a regulator and, and regulation seems to go in one direction despite the the broader effort of deregulation which began some decades ago and sometimes ebbs and flows we deregulate we regulate deregulate re-regulate point is that this is a area of compliance that creates cost and uncertainty there's absolutely no question about it regulation is an important piece of the puzzle okay all right so any questions so far about any of, any of this <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I'm not going to get um, uh, probably too far beyond the sales budget today, but I did want to talk about this idea of the approach to the budgeting process and who's involved. And your text talks about this idea of participative budgeting, which is sometimes called bottom-up. And what it basically in, involves is each level of management. How we, we define management is involved in the process, and they're all sort of asked what they think they can do in the coming period, in terms of sales, production, units, labor costs, materials costs, whatever. And then the information is sort of aggregated and sort of flows to the top, and the top management decides what to do about it, okay? And this, this participant of budgeting is sort of a, an idea that I think is probably more, um, uh, more idealistic than it is realistic, frankly. Um, and it's the idea that we're going to involve everybody in management in the process itself. It is, and I will just, this is my own personal opinion, so I, I wouldn't write this down. It's not going to be like a quiz or exam, but I, I think this is a little bit more aspirational than it is realistic. I personally think that a lot of lower levels of management really don't have enough information to, to really fully give a, an accurate assessment. And very often you get into this whole business of sandbagging. Sandbagging is basically 
oh gosh, I don't think we could do that. And we're going to, you know, and, and dally down the expectations so that they can achieve those those objectives more easily. And that makes sense. Human nature, right? If I think I, if I think I do a thousand units a month and I, but I'll say, oh, we only do 500 units a month, then we know it's pretty easy to get to 500. So we all look like shining stars. It's a difficult thing. And, and I know it sounds, in, in my saying this, it sounds like I'm being very critical of managers, but it's, I, I personally, I just think it's, it's been demonstrated too many times when people say, gosh, we just can't do this and don't hold my feet to this particular fire and whatnot. The other thing too, is that depending upon how we define management, I think there are some that really could care less about the process and, uh, and really don't get involved in it much. So it sounds like a great idea. I have yet to really see it fully work in practice. I'm more than willing to be um, surprised uh, in, in a way that challenges my assumptions, but I know the idea that makes sense. I will say this about participative budgeting. The more you can involve people in it, the more you get people to say, and the, and the more that they're able to buy into what the organization is doing. As I said before, I do think, in reality, most people are of goodwill. They want the company to succeed. Sometimes they just don't have the skills to come up with the formal budgeting plans, and they don't really know what's realistic uh, in terms of the idea of a goal being achievable with difficulty. So uh, it, it, unless that is instilled within all management levels, it, it really doesn't make sense to, to go this direction. So, and, and frankly, this is not really the process that's very often used. Instead, more of a top-down approach where top management sort of meets and they get the input of everybody, the accountants, the economists, find out what's going on, and then it kind of trickles down from there. And I know the term trickle down sounds very negative. It sounds like uh, uh, we're up here and you're down there and you're going to do what we say. I know that. I understand that. Uh, but that's very often the process that's done in most organizations. The, the value, though, of participant in budgeting is to allow people to have their say. Because I think we learn a lot from managers throughout the organization to say, this is a problem. This is not going to work. And, um, and that would not be classified, I think, or defined as sandbagging if they say, we can't do this. I need more people. I need another facility. I need 10 more trucks. I need whatever, whatever it happens to be. And so I think that, that managers always, always, always should listen to people whom they supervise. But in terms of the budgeting process itself, I think I'm a little bit skeptical. No, but that's my own particular point of view for whatever it's worth, okay? So some of the advantages are more accurate estimates uh, because of the detailed knowledge, what I just mentioned. Uh, and um, and they have, they've got to perceive the process as fair um, if they're involved in the process itself. The overall goal is to produce achievable budget objectives while still meeting the goals, okay? Achievable with difficulty is really the, the sort of the mantra you're going to be able to be or repeating. Some of the disadvantages of involving others is it's time consuming, it's costly, and this is kind of what I just said. I didn't use the term gaming, but I think that's the, the idea of slack that, hey, we can't possibly do 1,000 units a month. It's going to be 500. It's this idea of sandbagging or, or, or gaming. But a lot of times, managers will, their, their, their very increase in pay will depend upon their ability to achieve certain objectives. And so, why not lower your goals? and uh, and then just simply blow through them. <laughs> I think that that is, is simply a reality of, of what's going on here. This is, by the way, some of the difficulties that the, so the old Soviet Union had where they would sort of set objectives and, um, and everyone would say, well, we, can, we only do this much and we can only do this much. As a result, nobody did really very much at all. And so that was, that was kind of a problem. So the flow of this, and I, this is probably really hard to see. This is obviously your textbook itself, but uh, uh, oops. Uh, is trying to blow it up a little bit here. So you get a president or or a CEO or what? What? How are the top management structures organized? With it's chairman, CEO, president, C, chief operating officer, whatever it is, you got a top person, the vice president of production. This is just the production unit. We've got factory A, factory B, and department, 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 department all, all the way across. And so the idea here is the under participant budgeting scheme. They're all the information sort of flowing upward in terms of what the expectations are. Um, unfortunately, for those who really like this idea a lot, it's a very democratic idea. It's a very, it's a very inclusive idea. It takes into account lots of opinions and viewpoints that may not be heard in the C-suite, the top management suite. 
Uh, in reality, though, I think there are some problems with this, but this is the flow of information as it achieves the budgeting, uh, budgeting realm. And, but the key factor is still going to be what can be achieved. And what is missing from this discussion here, and this is really an area that I will frankly tell you, I, I, if you haven't already caught on, I'm sort of disagreeing with, is the idea that sometimes the financial community has their own expectations. If every department is dialing down their expectations for the coming budget year, and you get a final product that doesn't meet what the financial community's expectations are, then that's not, that's not good. Because they would expect the company to compete against those who are high flyers. And uh, if you're saying, well, we just can't do it, that's not a very good sign. And you want to keep attracting investment dollars. You want to keep your stock price high. I know that sometimes is a controversial uh, management tactic, but it's important to anybody who owns stock. You want to keep that price up there. Uh, you've got to make these goals achievable and achievable with difficulty, okay? All right, so uh, before we sort of get into the, the first budget here, and I said we'd probably end with the sales budget today, is uh, this idea between budgeting, which I think is a very short-term concept, and long-range planning. I really think this is extremely important because it sort of bridges the gap between an annual budget process that creates some sort of game plan, some sort of roadmap based upon some forecast of all these variables, sales, revenue, cost of goods, sold, great materials, whatever, and, and the long-range planning, which is really falls into a different sort of category, that is, where we, where we expect to be in five years, 10 years, what is our market share, what do we plan to do with these up and coming products and whatnot. So again, the time period is the big, is the big issue. And also the emphasis in the long run planning, we're more interested in things like what products are going to carry the day for us going forward? What markets are we interested in getting to? And what markets are we expecting to be getting into? Now, if I know these are terms that come out of strategic management, product development, market development, market penetration. These are all things that you may or may not have seen yet. Um, they are really more marketing terms, but they also are uh, are, are terms of art used in long range planning in what we call strategic management, which takes into account these ideas where we're not really interested so much in, you know, do we buy a truck in this year or not? Those are more short term budget issues. These are more like what kind of products do we have and, when, and what's going to carry the day? What are going to be the big stars that are, going to, that are, are going to be there? So these are not really things that in the budget process on a year to year get that much play, other than the fact that they may impact that short-term analysis. And then again, the amount of detail. And so less detail, longer term less. So as I said, we're not really interested in the long run when we buy an eight, one more truck or when we do, uh, dispose of a, of a building or something like that, okay? <clears throat> so the essentials of effective budget do not include, well, top-down budgeting, management acceptance, research analysis, sound organization structure. And the idea is that effective budgeting, and this answer says, do not include top-down budgeting. Uh, so that's what the authors believe there, and uh, uh, you can take that as you would, but since that's what the authors are going with here, understand that that's what you should go with as well on homework quiz and bonus. Uh, by the way, I, uh, and I, I would just say that not everyone accepts this idea of top-down budgeting as being illegitimate. Uh, if it were illegitimate, why do so many companies do it and, and do it successfully? So. But I think it's more aspirational. I do think it's probably going to be more of a trend in the future. I really do. In technology, we're starting to see this happening more and more. But I understand this is what the uh, the authors are sort of leaning into here. Okay. All right. So any questions so far? We've got about seven minutes or six minutes left to go. I, I don't want to get too deeply into this next segment other than to just sort of give you an overview of, of uh, of actual budgets themselves, what they might look like, because the uh, up to this point, what we've really talked about is is the process itself. What is the budgeting process? Who's involved? What the time frames are? What the objectives are? But here we're going to get into what the actual budgets look like. So we talk about a master budget. We're talking about this what we would think it would be. It was the it's sort of the, the accumulation, the aggregation of all individual budgets that sort of tie into this big picture budget. And within that, we've got two classes that we should talk about. Operating budgets, which deal with the, as, as the term implies, normal operations, routine operations of 
making sales, collecting revenue, uh, you know, incurring costs, paying, paying payables, all those kind of things are involved in the operational budget, of which the sales budget takes an important role. And then financial budgets, and the key among those are the capital budget, which deals with things like when we buy equipment, how much we pay for it, uh, over what time frame we depreciate it, those kind of things. And then the cash budget is another one of those. So operating budgets, most of the budgets we'll be looking at are operating budgets. Financial budgets, like the CapEx budget and the cash budget, which then tie into the budget balance sheet, those sort of work their way more into finance. And for those of you who will take a finance course sometime in the future, you will definitely see a capital budget and also a cash budget. And those are important financial budgets that really are um, less obvious and are not really, again, those are very definitely internal documents. There's no question about it. As opposed to the idea of, of uh, forecasting operating results, which if a publicly traded company will say what we expect to earn in sales, what we expect to generate in terms of net income, and all these other factors. But the internal budgets like CapEx budgets, I say CapEx, meaning capital expenditure or cash budget, those are ones that probably are not really shared with the outside world, okay? So this is kind of the flow of the process. I really like this slide a lot. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, for those of you who are, even those of you in the classroom probably have, have difficulty seeing it, but notice everything sort of flows from the sales budget, right? So the master budget is simply this, we don't create a master budget. The master budget is simply the accumulation of all of these budgets. But the first step in the process is to determine what sales are going to be. And everything flows to the master budget, uh, the sales budget. Everything flows to the sales budget. That's the important thing for us to realize. And if the sales budget is wrong, then pretty much everything else is going to be wrong. And when I say wrong, I'm not, uh, I'm not missing the, I'm mindful of the fact that there are going to be variances. But if it's wildly off, then you're going to have wildly uh, production budgets off. So it's got to be realistic. And again, this is where I go to this idea that's that's been very popular among some CFOs, chief financial officers, where the idea of budgeting should be flexible, that we shouldn't lock it in on November 15th of year of year zero, and then year one, we're stuck with it. In fact, if you get into February and decide, wow, things have changed, we need to make it, we need to make some change. I think that should be part of the picture. And I think personally, um, even though I come out of the financial community, if it means the financial community is not happy with it, well, that's too bad, right? Uh, maybe our stock price suffers as a result, but if we need to be also realistic and we need to motivate our employees. We can't give them budget uh, goals that are unattainable. So I really admired my boss who said, September 12th, 2001, the day of the terrorist attacks, forget the budget, it's, it's just, it's gone. It's not going to work. And I think that flexibility under, and I, I, obviously I realize that's a, a very uh, unusual situation, but flexibility needs to be built into it. So if we see sales, the sales budget is extremely high or extremely low in relation to what our actual performance is, we should do an, a, a, a flexible budgeting readjustment on that. And, and companies do that very often. They restate their objectives uh, throughout the year to the financial community. Usually, frankly, when things are going better than expected, but uh, when things are going worse than expected, they're sort of um, under uh, under the, the watchful eye of Wall Street. They're told to dial it down and warn us if there's a problem coming, that sort of thing. But everything flows from that, the sales budget itself. Uh, by the way, one final thing I'm about out of time is this idea of flexible budgeting that, that even though we may create a budget for, let's say it's a January 1st to December 31st fiscal year, but there is an idea that says every 12 months should be Every, as every month goes by, we should have a new 12-month starting period so the budgeting process is ongoing. It's not even an annual event where all the top guys go off, guys and women go off to some resort somewhere and, and hash it out for a week. Uh, maybe it should be just an ongoing process, particularly revolving around the idea of fluctuating sales, which, by the way, can be affected by things which are completely outside the control of management. The economy, uh, taxes, uh, strange things that might happen weather-wise. The pandemic, I don't think anybody expected that. So, so anyway, that's, as I mentioned at the outset, SAS is about as far as I'm going to get. I'm going to take this then to production. And again, we're looking at this from a manufacturing context. 
if we expect to sell a certain number of manufactured goods, we got to make those goods. And we're going to incur these costs. And so that's where we're going to go beginning Wednesday. And uh, I'll carry this discussion in through probably through next Monday. Next Wednesday, I'll probably go over some of the uh, example exercises and problems. So are there any questions for me? I don't see anything in the chat box just yet here. Okay. Well, if you do have questions on anything, get with me. And we will pick this up on Wednesday uh, from the sales budget and going on. So have a great day.